youth tear upon the core of blasphemy follow your prophet and on evil make a victory let our righteousness be a role model to our children making new generations of believers decently upbringing with parents as an example as gems we shape them fearing only Bismillah, assalamu alaikum, peace. Welcome to Closing the Gap. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. We have with us in the studio, Sheikh Yusuf Estes. Welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. How are you doing today, Sheikh? Everything, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, very good. It's nice to be with you today. Uh, jazakallah khair. Um, what about the gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots? Is that something we should discuss? Well, uh, certainly, Omar, that's a very important topic and has been since time immemorial, mm -hmm. those who have and those who don't. Mm -hmm. And there have been many uh, societies and ideologies that have been presented over the centuries in an effort to try to deal with this topic, in an effort to somehow even things out or to make mm -hmm. it better for those who don't have. And at the same time, those who have want to protect their interests. So we find different structures of governments and societies and cultures and all of them even today dealing with this subject of the poor and the wealthy and there's this gap in between. Mm. Very good. Uh, how do you see the current situation uh, between the rich and the poor? Well certainly today it's uh, different and yet in the same uh, there are similarities to what we've always seen. Mm. One of the things that we'll say that is Different is that there is a lot more available knowledge out there about what's going on. It's not just the just selected areas where a few people have the knowledge of what's happening. More and more people today are realizing about economy, what it's about, and what are the principles behind it. But at the same time, we still suffer from a large number of people being without and a large number of people who are very, very wealthy. Mm. So how do you think that the, the wealthy people are viewing this situation today? Not being one of those, <laughs> I would have to speculate from what I've read or heard and talked with some of those who are very wealthy. Well, they tell us that they're concerned, that a lot of them are concerned over holding on to what they have. But this is not a new situation it, by any stretch of imagination. When we look to the Gulf countries or when we look to the European countries, when we look to the societies of the West and the East, we find that a lot, a lot of the wealthy people are very concerned over the present economic situation, especially related to wars and security interests, uh, interest uh, in, that people have in the Internet and what's the transactions that are taking place there, financial transactions. So this is a big concern of the wealthy people looking at what's going on and what they need to do to sort of support what they have, protect themselves against the losses. Mm, very good. What about the, the people that aren't as fortunate in terms of financial situation? What, how are they viewing the current situation? Well, of course, having visited a number of countries, I've been in some of the poorest. If mm. you go, for instance, to India, if you go to portions of the what they call the third world countries, I was in Mandara, Kenya, and as recently as just a few months ago, we found places where people are living without even the basic necessities, like which what? we would water. Mm. One of the most basic of all necessities is water, Mandara, Kenya. There were places we visited that had absolutely no water. Yes, the right. way they got their water was that a child would take a donkey and walk and walk for approximately half of a day to a river and then fill up these jugs and containers with water that is really, I wouldn't want to wash my automobile. Mm. I wouldn't wash my car with the type of water he had to come back with. Not just because of the amoeboids and the bacteria that's in it, but some of the larger things that you find in it, not just dirt, but uh, uh, creepy crawlies, insects, mm. and uh, you know, mm. 
So, and then they would come back and spend the other half of the day to return. And then when they got all done, there was just barely enough there really to take care of the basic things, such as making wudu to pray, just to wash yourself up with basic hands, face, feet, things like this. And in some cases, there wouldn't be enough for that. Hmm. They'd have to make tayyamum. You know, when hmm. a person wants to pray, they need to be clean. And if you don't have water, you can use dust. Hmm. And imagine he's gone through all of this, and even the water is hardly potable. You, could, hmm. you, you and I wouldn't be able to drink it. We'd get sick. Right. And this is what they're having to cook with. This is what they're having to drink from. And sometimes not an, even enough left over for their uh, animals to take any of it. What did you? Would you say that there's a a lack of understanding the reality between the rich and the the less fortunate? For example, among the rich, do you think that there's a a divide? Do you think they don't see that that type of reality? I think there's always been that problem. Mm. That this is a gap that um, many don't want to be aware of. Mm. They don't really want to know. They just say the poor and leave it at that. There are those who have a lot, and they will consider themselves poor. Mm. A person has a lot, but it's still in his mind, he's looking up to the next person and saying, you know what, this guy is loaded, and here I am, I've only got a few million, and this guy's got a billion, you know. Right. And on the other hand, when you look to those that are very, very impoverished, as I was describing the situation in Bandera, Kenya, it's by no stretch of imagination the only place. Mm -hmm. If you visited other countries, in um, not just um, in Africa, but in the Indian continent, you'd find places where people similarly are suffering from lack of some of the basics. Just to have, as we mentioned, running water, there's also a lack of basic clothing, basic shelter. People that are living in cardboard boxes, making sticks and grass to make a shelter for themselves. Today, in today's world, not something you're seeing in National Geographics from 40 years ago, but right now this minute. And you could visit the Oriental countries and see this type of thing. But then you might be surprised that even in New York City, we have people who are living under bridges mm -hmm. who don't have any more than some of these people in the other countries we're talking about. Speaking about, uh, I mean, obviously, both you and I are from an American background. Mm -hmm. uh, what effect did it have on you to, to see that sort of thing? Because it's not something you generally see just walking down the street in America. So then when you visit these countries... I mean, obviously, that has to have, you know, some sort of eye-opening takes place. Uh, Omar, there's no doubt that a person coming from our background see these things firsthand. It has a tremendous effect on you. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that there are organizations that are visiting in places like Argentina and Chile, in South America, also in Central America, and they're seeing this kind of thing firsthand. And it's very, uh, you know, mind-blowing. It's, it's a shattering thing to your your insides when you realize that these are human beings just like I am. And yet look at the suffering that they're enduring. How could it be that, you know, we think of ourselves as not having so much, mm. but then when we look to these people, we realize that, oh my God, I didn't even know people were suffering like that in the world. Mm. It's a very uh, deep deep thought, I think, something that we all, we all have to think about. What does uh, Islam have to offer in this crisis and this difficulty? Well, as always, we look to Islam for the solution. Mm. But before we look to a solution, I think it's important to really identify the actual problem. Because okay. very often we hear people tell us what the problem is, but it might be superficial or mm. their explanation may not be detailed enough to really understand. Because if you don't really know the problem, you might try for what's called a quick fix. Mm. Human beings are known to do this. We're very prone to do this over the centuries that we want to find something real fast, solve the problem, push a button, and it's all finished and go on about our day. Mm. And especially with something like that we're talking about with these huge gaps that in our program, this is what we're talking about, these really huge gaps that, that we find being discussed around the world. And in all cases, we've got somebody who wants to offer some kind of quick fix. Mm. But Islam is not telling us to look for quick fixes. It's actually telling us to look closely at what the situation is, identify a problem, but then look to what the creator of the universe has offered for us. Mm. Now, Almighty God, 
Allah, the one and only creator. He is the one who's behind all that happens. And not only is he causing conditions to exist, but at the same time, he's providing us with solutions to these problems, provided that we properly identify what the problem really is, and then apply with his direction these solutions so that there will be not just a temporary fix, but an ongoing solution that becomes not only something to benefit one group, but to give a balance to all people concerned. This, now, is, this is how Islam is presenting this. Right Now, is that solution that Islam is, gonna, is presenting us, is that something that just one person has to do, or is it a collective responsibility, the poor, the rich, and the people in between? Obviously, because we're talking about the entire planet, mm. it is something that all the people would be involved in to some extent, mm. not just one or two. Because one or two people are not going to solve the problems for the whole entire six, six and a half billion that we have on the planet today. Right. And what Islam is, again, I want to go back to the, the solutions are coming to us from something revealed 1,400 years ago. So this is a great test, isn't it? Mm. To say that if Islam is in fact what it claims to be, a solution for humanity, claiming to be the source coming from the creator of the universe in the first place, claiming to be the eternal and final word of Almighty God, then for sure it should be able to give us a clear solution on these problems. It should be. Right. And how would we... Ad ourselves, you know, you and I, I'm just a normal person like you, and we're looking at these things and we're saying, oh, wait a minute, how could a document, the Quran, come 1,400 years ago? Now, all of a sudden, we're going to look today at the stock market, for instance. There's a, there's a subject, talk about the stock market, talk about the big banking system and economics, talk about the conditions we find people of portions of India, portions of the Orient, portions of even the Gulf, where you have such a widespread between those who have the haves and the have-nots. The Muslim countries are obviously no exception to this rule. Mm. So how could Islam, coming 1,400 years ago, provide us even with a crumb of a solution, much less give us the ultimate? And I think that's a big test for mm. Islam, and I think it's an opportunity for those who really want to open their minds to observe what Islam is saying. And if it works, if it really does provide a solution, whether or not you ever take the solution, whether or not you ever take the medicine, so to speak, mm. but you realize that it would work, mm. then this gives you an idea of whether or not uh, Islam is for real. Okay. So does Islam offer the solution? Well, of course, in our program we're going to say yes. Of course. We're going to be talking about some of those things not just in this program, but all of our programs, how does Islam look at this problem, and then what does it offer as a solution? Mm, very good. Now, because we're talking about people, human beings, we're talking about uh, a number of facets here. One is our logic. He, all humans are trying to talk about our logic, my thinking, your thinking, our thinking, ideologies mm. coming from here. But then there's something else, too, that has to be satisfied along the way, and that's the heart. Mm. because the emotional side is not ruled out by the mental side. Right. When you try to do this, there's some, there's some ideologies hold that that's enough, you know, but it doesn't satisfy. You still got people in the street screaming and hollering, it's not fair, it's not fair, we want, I want, we have to have, and this is because the heart hasn't been satisfied. Mm. In some cases, you will find that, like when I visited Mandera, the people were not out in the streets hollering and screaming for equal rights or for food or anything else. They were very, very, um, uh, I think, calm and tranquil over the whole thing. In spite of the fact that a woman mentioned five of her children had died in front of her eyes simply because they didn't have enough water. Not but sure. yet she was very calm with that. Now, why? And, and why would it be that somebody else in America, let's say, for instance, or in the West, could have what we would consider a pretty good income and have a big home and still wind up committing suicide? Mm. 
Mm. or kill their children. And mm. this happens. This is not yeah. a rare thing that takes place mm. that a woman will actually kill her children or a man kill his own children. Why? And, and by comparison, you look, how come these people over here seem to be okay with their poverty? These people, on the other hand, seem to have a lot of wealth, but there's a whole different attitude. So this attitude is coming from the logic or the heart. Mm. So this, again, we have to treat that. We're getting into a very uh, interesting uh, part of Islamic thought which is the, the matters of the heart and the unseen and what effect that has on the real world. Uh, and this is very important. Uh, we ha we're up against a hard break, so we'll we're going to go very quickly, just a very quick break, and we'll be right back, inshallah. So don't go anywhere because the conversation is just getting, just getting uh, interesting, I think, inshallah. So we'll be right back. Fearing only Allah, The Philosophy of Islamic Law, a program for restoring belief and trust within Muslims' mind and heart, and for re-establishing a true concept about Islamic rules for others. Welcome back to our show, Closing the Gap. I'm here with Sheikh Yusuf Estes. I'm your host, Omar Dunlap. Uh, Sheikh, you were just getting into the solutions Islam has to offer uh, and, and closing that gap between the, the rich and the, the less fortunate, the, the poor. So I'll let you continue with, with your thoughts. Well, before we went up to the break, we discussed what is the situation mentally. Hmm. Okay, and we talked about that some people view their situation as being impoverished and others view their own situation as being well endowed, that they have plenty. And But to take an impartial view of both of them, we might be surprised that we would conclude that the one who claims to have so much, we would say, he doesn't have anything. Mm. On the other hand, somebody who is saying, I have nothing, we'd look at him and say, man, you got everything. And this is because it's really not based on logic, not real logic, but rather human logic. And those who want more and more and more, and those who are satisfied with whatever they have. Now what determines that? What makes that up? And that's when we come back now to this. <clears throat> According to Islam, and of course that's our premise, we take everything from Islam, we're saying that Islam is having the solution. According to a teaching of Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, if the son of Adam had a mountain of gold, mm. he'd want another one just like it. <laughs> now imagine, mm. a mountain of gold, and he'd want another one just like it. In another saying of Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us that the human being, son of Adam, is out here going after wealth and grabbing and pulling at it, you know, trying to accumulate wealth to the extent that nothing will satisfy him until he fills his stomach with what? Mm. Dirt. The, the dirt, yeah. Meaning he dies. So nothing will satisfy the son of Adam. Nothing satisfies him in this life except for a few. And this is used throughout the Quranic statements. Illa ladina, except for those. So the majority of the people are thus, mm. but there are always those few over here that don't have this uh, situation. And let us look to that. What about these people we mentioned in Mandara, Kenya? Well, first of all, they were all Muslims. And the lady I spoke about that had lost the five children right in front of her eyes, she's a strong believer, very strong believer, mm. to the extent that even though she had to build her own shelter out of her own hands with available bamboo rods and grass that she wove together, and she put that together, and then she took brambles, thorny bushes, and scattered them around in a, a fence-like uh, design around this little dome that she built. 
Now, she did it all herself because her husband and older children, the older men, are out far away, miles and miles away, trying to find pasturage for their sheep and goats. Mm, and she might not see them again for months. Mm. So here she's doing this all on her own. And she's not by herself. There are other women doing this same thing. So while we had her on camera, we were interviewing them to, to show people back in the UK how important it is to contribute to help this effort going on in Mandera, Kenya. It's called Islamic Relief and working with the government of Mandera, or actually for all of Kenya. And what the idea was is to get these people to talk about their situation a little bit and show the folks back home, look, you know, there's people a lot worse off than we are. Yeah. Let's help them out, especially during the month of Ramadan. That was a premise. Well, now here I am talking to this lady, and they're translating for her. And I said, tell us, ma'am, what it would be like if you really had sufficient water, that children didn't have to walk for a whole day, half the day going and half the day coming back with these donkeys. There are a lot of donkeys around there with these jars and containers on them, you know, and going all this way, coming back, you know, just to bring a basic thing. Mm. How would it be, I said, if you had all this water that you could bathe as much as you like, that you could, you know, have a tub of water, you could wash your clothes, the children could play in the water, animals could have all the water they wanted to drink, etc. How would that be? Mm. And she said, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> Actually, she, uh, the wow. way she said it was real quick. It was like, no. Sure. And when they translated back to me, she didn't like the idea. I said, what? She didn't understand. The translator probably didn't do a good job. So I tried another way to explain it. No, ma'am, I'm saying, how would it be if you had water here like some of the other villages that we've already been able to bring water to? Tell us, you know, how you, you would feel about it. Mm. You know, the way you do in journalism, you try to uh, set it up and let them, right. you know, come and respond to what you're suggesting. Mm. And my suggestion was going nowhere with her. Mm. She came back again. She said, no, I don't think it's a good idea. All right, I'll bite. What? What am I saying wrong? She said, first of all, if we had an abundance, an excess amount, this is exactly how they translate it, if we had an ex excess amount, more than we need, then we would be taking it for granted. Mm. We would not be thinking about Allah anymore. We'd be thinking about ourselves and want more. I'm satisfied with what I have. Masha'allah. What he wants me to have is what I'm having. Masha'allah. And I'm satisfied with it. It's amazing. And it brought me to my knees. I mm. literally wanted to cry because I realized this woman is a believer. Much stronger than me. And here I am you know, thinking... You know, we're kind of hard up ourselves. We need this, we need mm. that, we need so many things. We're trying to do Dawa, open a TV station, all the things we're thinking about. And here is a lady who doesn't have enough water mm. to take a full drink. She couldn't, if I gave her medicine, she couldn't take it because she doesn't have enough water. She couldn't wash her hands. She could not even get the sand out of her eyes with water because they didn't have that much. And here she's telling me that we're okay. Because we have Allah. This is what is called in Arabic a very high level of Iman. Mm. On the other hand, I have met people who were very famous, wealthy, well-known, and asked me to pray for them so that they could put a swimming pool in their second house. Mm. MashaAllah in their second house because you know and talking as though you know we're having a hard time you know I lost a, a multi-million dollar contract the other day so pray for us and I'm thinking hold on hold on why would a person in this high position being so well off ask for prayers for themselves and I said I'll tell you what I will pray for I'll pray Allah guide you Mm -hmm. I'll pray that Allah will help you to realize who you really are, what you really have, and what you don't have. Mm -hmm. Because having an abundance in this world is not the solution for anybody. An abundance and excess in this world could be a curse to anyone. Mm -hmm. Because these things will all be against us on the Day of Judgment. It's interesting that this is the topic we're covering because just last night I decided that I need to sit down and read some Quran. I, I haven't 
gotten as close to the Quran as I have in the past. And so I said, I need to take some time out and read some Quran. And I remember this verse as clear as I'm reading it right now. Uh, maybe you know it in Arabic. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe you have it. You'll, you'll know it from my uh, translation here. But it said that the wealth and sons is not going to bring you any nearer to Allah, to God. It's not going to bring you any closer. Right? You, maybe you have it. Maybe you don't. But it's, that's not the thing that's going to bring you close. Yeah. yeah, it's your wealth and your children. Right. Your your, your children, your wealth, uh, your mal and your walid, you mm. know, because that's exactly telling us for the one who is more afraid, more afraid mm. of losing his wealth that he would make profit in his business and afraid from losing his uh, offspring, his family. He's more concerned about that than he is concerned about his relationship with Almighty Allah. Mm. Then just wait for the Day of Judgment mm. to come. Mm. And it is coming. That's a very good point that you brought up. Now, didn't the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, if I'm not mistaken, didn't he say that, that something to the effect of contentment is, a, is like a well that's never exhausted or never runs out, something to yeah. that effect? Exactly. To yeah. be content with what you have is the goal of a true believer. Mm. You find yourself in a situation that you can change, then you should work to change it. Right. You find yourself in a situation that you cannot change, then you learn to have what's called in Arabic sabr, mm. which is patience and perseverance. Right. Actually, it's more than patience, it's persevering in patience. Mm. But then there's another thing too, and that is to have the hikmah, the wisdom, to know the difference between these two situations. Mashallah. To know if I'm in a situation I need to work on and I have the ability, let me try to change that. And the other case, well, okay, I'm in a situation that I can't change, I need to be patient, but then how do I know the difference between the two? This is a very key point. Mm. Now, what does Islam show us in general for the world, not believers, not Muslims, because Islam is offering the solution for all humanity. And that is for those who have. Allah is saying your wealth that you hold needs to be purified. Mm. Because it isn't pure until you've purified it every year. Annually, the Muslims should and must go through their holdings that they have not touched for a year. It's just sitting there for one year, unused. That becomes taxable. You tax yourself. Tax yourself, go through it and do an inventory, and then take two and a half percent of that wealth, the holdings, not your income, but the holdings, and then take this and distribute it amongst the poor around you, especially starting with your own family first. This mm. is called purification or zakah. Zakah doesn't mean tax. Right. It doesn't mean charity. It means purification. Mm. To make zakah. And it's used in the Quran for other words, uh, like purifying your body and so on. So zakat is a purification of the holdings of those who have. Now for the one who doesn't have, well, he doesn't pay this. Right. There's nothing to pay it on. If he's below a certain minimum or he hasn't held anything for a whole year, then he wouldn't have to pay anything at all. Right. And actually could be the recipient right. yeah. of what's being distributed by those who are in a position to put the wealth out there. Now, it, there are several points about this. And they are broken down into the categories so that how can I distribute this? Who would come first? What would be the priority one? Right. Well, obviously a human being who's going to die, that's what you want to look at first. Right. Those who are the believers who are your own family. And what if they're not believers? Because a lot of us, you and I, for instance, our families are not Muslims. Mm. But yet they still have the right to this. Mm. They still have a right to be taken care of from this purification. That's before right. we talk about charity, before we talk about what's uh, called sadaqa. Right. We're talking about this purification, which must be paid. Right. Now, what does this, does this level? No, it won't level it out. It's only 2.5%. Right. What about the other 97.5%? <laughs> but what it does do, it encourages the poor to keep going and keep their faith. Right. And at the same time, for the wealthy, it makes them remember that, hey, you know, I have to take care of the other people too. Right. Now there's another thing Islam is offering us, mm. and that's fasting, the month of Ramadan. While I'm fasting, I'm in tune with those who are all year long without food. Right. And suddenly I'm hungry, I feel my stomach growling and rumbling, and I feel that thirst in my throat. Ah, ah. Mm. And by the time it's, we break the fast, I'm thinking, wow, 
And these people deal with that every day. Right. This is why so many Muslims like to pay their zakah, purification of wealth, during, during the month of Ramadan. Right. This is a good time to do that and take more reward for it. Right. Well, Sheikh, uh, I wish we I wish we had so many shows we could dedicate to just this topic because you're really doing it justice, and it's uh, it's something that's really important for the Muslim Ummah and the world in general to really think about and know about. And I think we should encourage our viewers, uh, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, to do more research on that. But unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. I thank you for being with us, Sheikh. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be back next week, inshallah. So don't forget about us. Same time, same channel. Uh, and I'm your host, Omar Dunlap, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, you tear upon the core of blasphemy. Follow your prophet and on evil make a victory. Let our righteousness be a role model to our children. Making new generations of believers decently upbringing With parents as an example As gems we shape them Fear